after more than 5 years on early access, the definitive VR melee combat and sorcery a little bit sandbox game recently got its full 1.0 release. With that, the game got a long awaited feature. A completely new mode centered around clearing procedural dungeons with a full on progression system and a goal to work towards. In other words, Blade and Sorcery has now turned into an actual structured video game. I was pretty excited about this update. I always respected Blade and Sorcery for what it achieved, for how it pushed the development of VR melee combat ahead. But the pure sandbox was never for me. It never was enough to keep me entertained to just fight waves of enemies, to have combat as an end in itself, even though admittedly Blade and Sorcery combat is very entertaining. So we are here today to find out if this new Blade and Sorcery is any good. Little spoiler, I did not enjoy it altogether that much. That's probably a minority opinion and I still do think Blade and Sorcery is a great game, but not so much for playing, more because of its importance for VR, the influence it had on the evolution and development of VR melee combat, but yeah, uh, le let's get into it in a bit more detail. When creating a new character, you now decide if it's for the sandbox mode, so everything Blade on Sorcery was until the latest update, or the Crystal Hunt, which is the new game mode. After a bit of basic character customization, we start our journey shipwrecked on a small island. The adventure starts off pretty strong. There's a bit of tutorializing, a bit of climbing, a bit of combat, a bit of exploration, and a lot of lore to collect. It's something about an ancient portal that can only be opened with magic crystals so everybody is looking for them, soon you will also join the ranks of the crystal hounds. I stopped caring about the lore after the first few pages, I'm not here to read, I'm here to brutally murder some folks that are all way too attractive for some reason. After we got acquainted to our new home, we get introduced to the trader and make our first transaction. Here we learn that we have to find map parts in order to get somewhere where we are supposed to be, so off we go to our first dungeon. The word dungeon might not do it justice. A big part of the map was outdoors and at times pretty grand. The level is linear but there are a few rooms off to the side that have loot. After you run you can sell that loot at the trader or decorate your home with, to your liking. My skull collection kept falling off the shelf for some reason though. There's a surprising amount of verticality, you'll be climbing a lot. The climbing is pretty good, it feels odd at first as it has a lot of simulated weight so your character movement does not match your physical movement but after getting used to it, it, it felt good, I liked it. There's also motion controlled swimming, completely underutilized. When you find yourself swimming it, it means that you fucked up, that you fell somewhere where you were not supposed to fall but it's cool that the mechanic is in the game. We murder a few hotties, collect a bit of loot and after a job well done return home. But we need two map parts, so we do the whole thing again. Already on our second run we recognize some dungeon tiles that we visited before, but most of it is still fresh. Map part pocketed, it's time for the first grand showdown. A new icon appears on the travel map, we click it and are off to a new dungeon, this time from a completely different tile set, more elven ruin than medieval castle. At the end of this dungeon we head to our first boss fight. It's a gimmicky fight, you just need to destroy all crystals on the golem's body. Before you can do that though, you need to destroy 3 crystals in the boss arena to remove the golem's shields. Golem destroyed, we can exchange its head crystal for a magic crystal of our choosing, which will unlock spells for us. There are 6 schools of magic in blade and sorcery and here we choose one of them. I went for lightning magic to go full cis lord on those fools. Finally we get ported back to our home island, see one of six thingies light up in front of the big door which gives us a clue on what we'll have to do next. Back in our shack we learn our new spells. This front room is basically our skill tree. We slot our magic crystals in and see the available spells for our schools of magic. To purchase them we need white crystals which we find as random loot in the dungeons. Schools of magic that are slotted next to each other can have combination spells. You will be able to get 6 spell crystals in total, so you can either get the basic level of all magic schools in the game, or you can choose to focus on 1 or 2 spells by upgrading them up to 3 times each. It's a neat immersive menu, I, I, I like stuff like that. There are two separate progression systems, the spell system we just discussed and the gear progression. As you play through the game, higher tiers of weapons and armor are made available for purchase, which you'll need to take on the increasing enemy difficulty. 
At this point I was enjoying the game quite a bit. We need two more map parts so off we go to the dungeon again. There are different sets of enemies that will enter the picture over time from basically naked guys, well not naked, you'll have to install a mod for that, but unarmored, over the medium armored wildlings to heavy armored guards and at the top of the food chain the eye, which are heavy armored magic wielders. The numbers of skulls seems to denote how many reinforcements the enemies are going to call in. Our next two dungeon runs get a bit more familiar. We see more map tiles that we have already seen before. We remember loot spots and where possible exits for each tile are. When we finally get to the second boss fight and are greeted by exactly the same golem that we killed before, a bleak realization starts to sink in. We are going to have to do this six times, are we? Well, worse actually. From this time on we'll have to find three map parts between each golem fight. So how this works is that there is a set number of pre-made tiles that are stringed together in a randomized way to give the dungeon a different layout each time you go in. There's one tile set for the boss arena dungeon and the elven ruin thing and one tile set for the map part dungeon, the medieval castle thing. Already at this point it is very rare that we see new tiles in the dungeon. Remember, this is not a roguelike. I'm glad that it isn't, by the way, I'm not too fond of VR roguelikes, but looking at a good roguelike, they get away with letting you play the same thing over and over again by forcing a certain degree of randomization in your build, which means you'll have to play around with different builds every run, keeping the experience fresh. This is not the case here. Sure, you can change up your loadout between runs, but only to a degree and it will not change the way you play in a major way. So here every run feels pretty much identical. It gets old fast, too fast. The way the procedural combination of tile sets is made works well, it's seamless, it's good, but for a game with a linear progression like this I would have liked to see more, or any for that matter, curated areas. Ideally all dungeons for the progression related runs, ones where you get the map parts and the boss arena areas should be handmade. In addition they could have offered these procedural dungeons as a means to earn extra cash, that would have been a lot more enjoyable. The only thing to do besides the procedural dungeons are these combat arenas where you'll just fight a few waves of enemies for some extra cash, so basically old blade and sorcery, I wasn't really interested in that. The golem, which you would indeed have to fight 6 times, gets new attacks after the second and fourth kill, that makes it a bit more difficult, but that does not change the mechanics of the fight at all. And as soon as I figured out that you can destroy all the crystals with magic, the fight was completely trivialized anyway. At this point I probably would have dropped the game, I only continued to push through because I wanted to make this video, it was just too repetitive for me. Granted the combat is fun, it's super brutal but not in a disturbing way, more in a f funny way, but still it was just too repetitive for me. And while I was dragging on, all the little problems the game has were getting more and more frustrating. The biggest offender was movement, sometimes the character's movement would just stop working, you'd get super slow as if walking through mud and and the only way to get some speed was to start walking diagonally. I guess it's a bug and I don't know if it affects everyone but for me it was pretty bad. It was so bad that I accustomed myself to do the what I called the diagonal shuffle where I would slide diagonally from left to right to get the somewhat manageable land speed. There were smaller things I would have overlooked if I had more fun playing. There's this rainbow elevator which slows you down while you fall, at one time that effect did not go away until I restarted the game. Sometimes you try to grab the handle of the loot chest but instead grab things that are inside the chest, those should not be grabbable while the chest is closed. Sometimes enemies will get stuck with their arm in your shield, I don't even know how that happened but it happened several times for me and I had to leave my shield behind every time, no way to get it back. Then there's a trader which I had my gripes with. For one, the tier system is not particularly interesting. You basically have the same weapons that you'll have to repurchase in each tier from 0 to 3 to get a version with better stats. The same for armor. Oh, and the stock of the shop is randomized, which I don't get at all. Most of the time I was running around with two different gloves, because the shop would always just have the left glove on offer from the set I wanted. Why? Just to annoy me? Then there's the UI. For immersion they went to go mainly without a UI, which I respect, 
But with stat-based itemization like they have here, that's not possible. So their solution is that you can see the start of an item which you are holding in your hand by opening your inventory. Instead of having no UI, you suddenly have a huge UI with a lot of information that you are not interested in in that moment. Just let me see the starts of the item I'm holding via button press or looking at your wrist or something like that. It's worse for armor. You can only equip or unequip armor in the changing room. But in the changing room, you cannot open your inventory. So if you want to compare the stats of an armor piece as a trader with the armor piece you're wearing, you'll have to go to the changing room, disrobe, exit the changing room, open your inventory, compare the stats, go back to the changing room, re-equip your armor. It's the worst. To add insult to injury, the game was very easy for the most part. I was becoming quite the menace with a short blade. That changed a bit towards the end of the game when lots of fully armored grunts took the field. I even died a couple of times and was starting to enjoy the game a bit more again. I was forced to change strategy. I had to bring a blunt weapon for example and made more and more use of the dark side. Only then I realized how powerful magic really is in this game. You see, I went full on this lord. I didn't plan to do it, it just happened. Next to lightning magic, I also uh, maxed out mind magic, which happens to give you a forced choke at level 3. I do not recommend using mind magic if you want to make a serious playthrough of the game. Now the basic mind magic spell is a slow time, which is fine, but higher level mind magic makes it so that you yourself are not affected by the slow time. There's even one that triggers slow time automatically when a projectile approaches. That is so incredibly overpowered, it, it basically sets the game to super easy mode. I abused the hell out of it because, you know, I just wanted to get through the game as fast as possible at that point. But yeah, yeah it's a bit unbalanced is all I'm trying to say. That's fine for the sandbox where it's all about the power fantasy, but a structured video game has to be balanced at least a little bit or it gets boring real quick. After killing the golem for the sixth time, the ending credits roll and you can go ahead and repeat the whole thing, I guess indefinitely, to try new spells and such. I was done at this point, well I was done way before that, but I think at this point I have seen enough to formulate an opinion about the Crystal Hunt game mode. It took me about 12 hours to play through the thing, which seems like a decent playtime considering it was only an update to an already very established game. But playtime is not everything. You have pretty much seen 90% of the game after 10% of the playtime. For me it was too long, way too much repetition. Now I want to make really clear that this is only a review for the Crystal Hunt game mode. Blade and Sorcery was already a very beloved game before that. For me the pure sandbox was not engaging enough. But if you spend a lot of time in the game, if you just like the combat for the sake of it, then this is a great update. It lets you mutilate pretty people in a bit more structured and purposeful way. But if you're not a fan of the sandbox and are looking for an actual structured video game, the Crystal Hunt only delivers a very bare bones version of that and I would not recommend it. As I said in the beginning of the video, I still think Blade and Sorcery is a great game. It was very important for VR in general and melee combat in VR games in particular and I have a lot of respect for that and for the process in which the game came to be. Started as a solo dev project, Warp Frog is now a 20 people strong studio. The vast majority of the development time was spent on pushing the limits of physics based melee combat, not only for this game but for VR in general. I like to think of Blade and Sorcery as a field work that needed to be done to bring VR melee combat to the state it is in now and I hope the studio with that field work done focuses on the next project whatever that may be I'm sure they could accomplish great things that is it for me today videos were a bit slow lately that's because there was not much going on in the world of VR and I haven't been playing that much that's bound to change though there are some very cool things coming up in the second half of the year starting with Into the Radius 2 very soon I've also not been playing 7 days to die anymore because I'm waiting for the 1.0 release that's also happening very soon which seems like a major miracle so things are going to speed up on this channel as well also, we are very close to 1000 subscribers now, which is terribly exciting. If you aren't subscribed already, why not push us over the threshold for more VR content, you know? Bye.